welcome to Feeding Without the Feed Line. This is Jason Gross with UNL Extension on Biological Systems Engineering. Uh, my background with the Extension has typically been uh, working on wastewater uh, uh, runoff issues uh, from small, medium sized animal feeding operations in Nebraska. And one of the things that came up a few years ago with uh, some of the costs of uh, forages and grains out there is uh, how do we reduce some of the the cost of feeding calves and, and working with these calves and cows. And uh, so we did a little bit of work on fencing and feeding and, and managing calves on uh, forages to kind of help reduce some of those costs. So if, if we want to go ahead and, and we're going to manage some of these calves without the feedlot, some of the objectives that we wanted to do uh, based off the fact that we want to reduce some of the cost of infrastructure by not adding pens, the, the concrete and the steel. Um, some of the, if you're AFO or CAFO on the, the runoff water treatment facility. But also, if we're in a, in a forage based grazing operation or crop residue grazing, you know, then we can eliminate baling and hauling, grinding, and the manure spreading, which is also a significant cost to the operation. And taking these calves out on, on, uh, on forages, and, and we can help reduce the mortality and sickness. Uh, control mud and dust a little bit better than in a feedlot. But as a flexible component to this, and maybe uh, guys that are interested in expanding, but without wanting to build infrastructure, then maybe we can add, help add some grazing opportunities for them. And again, from, from my work side on an environmental issue, is that we can reduce some of our risk uh, if we're connected to surface water by not having um, these feeding areas developed. But if we want all the comforts of the feedlot, some of the things that we're going to have to do to be able to house these, these, uh, these calves or cows in uh, using permanent or temporary fencing. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of new technology and fencing materials, specifically on, on electric fence, that uh, we may not be totally used to on, you know, whether it's polywire and step and post. Gallagher's got a tumble wheel. We're developing the A post, and then we develop the pivot fence for, for extension. And uh, there's many others out there, uh, but these are the ones that, that I've been working with. Um, one of the main issues if you're working with calves or cows in the fall or winter, which is primarily where we want to do a lot of our forage grazing or residue grazing, is we're going to have frozen soil. And uh, pounding in posts and moving the wire uh, manually in frozen soils uh, contributes to a considerable amount of labor. Usually uh, uh, makes us look away from this type of, uh, of grazing based off of that. Uh, we want to be able to provide uh, uh, controlled dust and, and mud. Uh, we want to manage our residue uh, appropriately, not only for, for the mud and the dust, but also that we want to leave a residue behind and, and improve the soil uh, for our crops and systems for uh, the, the next following year. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was be able to have control over grazing efficiency. We suggested at first, you know, maybe we wanted to go up to 90%, but really it's up to the producer and how much residue they want to be able to manage you know, for their crops and systems long term. Uh, labor is a, a major component to whatever we're going to do and to make sure that we're, we're minimizing our labor and making things user friendly and practical for the producer. And one of the things, if we want to get some feedlot performance out of these calves, that we must be able to know what we're, what yields we have on our forages, and then really what they're consuming, and how to manage them in that, in that fashion. So one of the major obstacles that we've run into in, in, in working with this is, is fencing, whether it's permanent fencing or, or what I call semi-permanent uh, or single hot wire. A lot of that has to do with labor and then also wildlife uh, and how that affects our, our uh, we won't get into forage selection, but there, there could be a major component to uh, what type of forage or multi-species forages, when to plant and when to harvest, and what time of the year would, would be uh, advantageous for us on that. Soil compaction, health, erosion, and, and fitting these, these into crop rotations on, on whether it's irrigated uh, crops or dryland crops uh, is also another great topic for another day. And, and we can use the grazing operation to help improve these conditions on soil health and, and crop productivity. Um, always uh, the wealth of the animal and our husbandry um, uh, 
skills that we have and our stockmanship and be able to, to uh, move and handle these these uh, calves and cows and how to treat ones if they're if ones do get sick and and uh, working with them is a critical component goes with our labor issue there too forage quality uh, can uh, deteriorate throughout the winter and do we need to get in there and do some more supplements or maybe we want to push some energy or more protein through the forage to help get some more uh, feedlot performance water sources and power supplies another critical component and we won't get to those, some of these today, but those are all things to think about in, in every grazing operation that we do. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a two-wire permanent electric cross fence that you know I was part of a crew that we built uh, quite a few miles of this this summer, and and I bring this up is is uh, because a lot of our cropping fields don't have permanent fences, or uh, but when we build these things um, in our pastures, it, it's uh, it's amazing how how quick and, and you may be even surprised on, on how uh, the cost to, to build these uh, type of fences and, and it shouldn't be a limiting factor on, on our grazing system for crop fields. They go up uh, very fast and, and it can be very economical too. And, you know, we use uh, uh, you know, this is a six, six wire Jenny trailer that we've been using on, on building fence. Things like this help us, uh, you know, whether it's post pounders or skid loaders and help us build these fence rapidly. Maybe even make them portable and if, if needed. A two wire, a semi permanent, uh, something that we built that's using, you know, three and a half and four inch posts and 11 16 fiberglass. Very low cost, but they can withstand some of the wildlife and deer or elk issues that you have, and you can adjust the wire height to, to manage that if necessary. But these types of things are out there that we can be using in our uh, in our crop field. Uh, as our perimeter fences or our boundary fences. Gallagher uses a shovel wheel, and this is an option for our, our cross fencing. Uh, a, a lot of temple wheels are out there and being used. And of course, uh, stepping posts and poly wire, uh, pigtails, uh, are very popular. A lot of people use them uh, in all kinds of grazing operations, but they do are limited to our frozen soils and uh, um, as we get into the wintertime. One of the things that we did to kind of uh, put all this together and, and make it more useful in, in larger groups of calves on frozen soils is, a, is, a, is a, for us to take a center pivot or lateral uh, irrigation system and convert it into our movable cross fence. And, and uh, through request of a producer, uh, we did that a couple years ago, and it worked so well that we ended up improving it in, in a University has, has applied for a patent for it too, but uh, it gives us advantages within stock call type grazing and windrow grazing. We can have motor control, uh, wireless control of our center pivot, and we can move this fence however we want to, whether we're on site or off site. We wanted to uh, be able to have it so it's simple and easy to install and remove without any alterations of pivot, and then that it will fit. On uh, almost all makes and models of center pivot that is manufactured, and uh, and our big labor issue on frozen soils, uh, we wanted to be able to cover that too. So every center pivot manufacturer out there uses truss rods to stabilize the structure of the pivot. So we went after that uh, using the truss rod hanger that we've manufactured, and and uh, we can set the this uh, post anywhere along the pivot tower. Manage wire height and use as many as we need to, depending on how uh, how rough the, the soil the crop field is. Going over our tower bracing, um, just using a simple uh, uh, pipe clamp with insulator to help protect that wire. And then we use a uh, um, a tension control that as that pivot moves through the field and as the pivot lengthens and contracts and moves up and down, that we need it to be able to stabilize that wire under proper tension. Without it, you know, uh, getting too much stress and breaking or drooping down too low and getting snagged, so we developed a, a tension control system for it too, and that wire stabilized at a proper tension. But a couple of the the systems that we used this on back in 2011, the fall and the winter, uh, we did uh, see how well this would work. We used 330 head of uh, feeder calves for about 53 days on uh, what we call the field one on this 
center pivot, and uh, um, we grazed it as a stock, as a standing up stockpile crop. It's about 2.8 tons of the acre on this fall oat, and it was fall oat planted after harvest of wheat, and uh, which we got great tonnage off of it. But because it was such a heavy crop, we grazed it uh, without harvest, without windrowing it or anything. Uh, we did end up losing about half of it, but that ended up being route crop residue. For the next year's corn crop, so it wasn't totally a loss. Calves grazed about 13 and a half pounds per head per day on, on dry matter basis, and the producer was uh, busy harvesting his fall crop, so uh, chose to move it about every every three days. Throughout the winter, we did lose a little bit in quality. Uh, if you recall, back in 2011, 2012, um, it was very dry and a very warm winter for us here in Nebraska, and this. Uh, trial was done in uh, Chase County in the uh, southwest part of the state. Here's some of the calves out there. This would be about the last week of October of that year, uh, grazing these oats. And then you can see here that uh, they come right up to the pivot fence and, and as, it, as it splits that pivot. And they did uh, leave uh, some of the oat back as, as they trampled it down. You know, They wanted to eat the bottom of the oat to the top, so they trampled quite a bit of it. The neat thing about it is, is that once we were advancing the pivot and, and giving them more forage to graze, they really didn't go back to to uh, um, grazing what what they already left behind, and uh, that kept the calves from really uh, overworking the soils or, or putting a lot of compaction out there. And, uh, they were always ready for the for the new forage to graze. In the second field of this, which ended up being on the same pivot, uh, but this is the other half of the field. About the same number of calves, about the same number of days. The yield was a little less because it was planted a few days later. And uh, we went ahead and windrowed it around the week of uh, Thanksgiving. And because of the windrow, they ate more, almost 16 pounds per head per day. But they utilized much more of it. We're, we were approaching 80, 85%, 80, 85% of the, of the week grade. So the calves did much better on, on the windrows, and we had much more control over the residue that was left back out in that field. See here the the windrow to oats. Um, the, the calves were waiting as the as the pivots move for them to go in there and, and tackle the new windrows. And much like a uh, in a movable feed bunk, you know the calves all took their place and, and waited as that pivot was moving, and they spread themselves out the, the whole entire length of the pivot. We want to make sure that we were uh, feeding them for our desired performance. On these heifer calves, and so we were out there just a uh, very simple way of measuring yield. We just built a slip sheet out of uh, plywood and slipped it under the windrow and, and waited. We did multiple uh, sites throughout the field and, and conducted our uh, calculator averages. And one thing you can notice, you do see some oat um, uh, load off of the windrow, but this was right after. Um, it was about 60 days after we harvested it, and it was. About a 70, 80 mile an hour wind went through that area at that, 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 that time. So the windrows really held up um, nicely throughout the winter. On our stockpiled portion, we did some uh, clippings and we measured and dried samples out on them. Our ultimate goal um, was on uh, reducing cost, and, and one of the components was, was not spreading manure. But the uniform uh, forage out there, we had we had uniform uh, manure application, and it was all all things that are going to be uh, helpful to the crop for the next year. Last year we did uh, about the same thing on uh, fall oats, and uh, we had little less um, tonnage. It was a much drier year, 2012, and uh, we had limited water out there. Uh, the producer did, uh, didn't windrow this year, and we went ahead and grazed it as a stockpile. And, uh, we went. Uh, I thought very nicely. The calves went and picked up almost 70 percent of it. The forage intake was was high at 17, and moved the pivot about every other day. Even though we did get some snow last year, it was quite amazing that uh, our quality really didn't change that much throughout the winter. This was uh, um, a few days after about a foot of snow. The oat did lodge down a little bit, but the calves still went back after that snow shrunk down. Did go back and pick up about 70% of that. 
So what did we learn? Is that we could house these calves and calves um, with with fencing and different fence options that are out there. Uh, if we do, we do some windrowing. Um, you know, we can um, control some, or maintain some of that quality by allowing that that uh, forage to windrow or to cure into windrow, much like uh, stacking hay. Uh, a windrow is, is very similar. Uh, we want it to shed the water and stay dry. Uh, one of the things, as far as our losses were measured, and we observed was that the less windrows that we had, the better our uh, our quality was, but also the less loss that we had. So, if we want to do in the future, be able to minimize our windrows by using, you know, large draper heads or raking them together, and make uh, the less windrows the bigger ones. Uh, we can control daily rationing uh, by the motion. If we use pivots or we use poly wire or whatever we do, based off our labor that we want to include in this operation, and take improves with our dry, more dry uh, forage that we give them. Manure was uh, naturally spread, and the behavior of the calf dramatically um, uh, improved. You know, we producer going out there every day and checking water, and moving the, the pivot, or moving the fence. Uh, really helped provide that low stress uh, environment for that calf and allowed the, uh, the stockmanship and the handling of that calf to be uh, uh, significantly improved. And that was something that we knew was going to happen, but we didn't realize it was going to happen that dramatically. So we were, we were quite impressed. Now we've got uh, uh, other things that we got, we've been doing on crop residues and, and other fencing options and, and uh, uh, cross fencing. Boundary fencing I've been doing for the uh, extension, and feel free to give me a call or send me an email if anybody's got any questions.